the Bible, turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 18, if you would please. John, chapter 18. Welcome to you. Welcome to anybody out there online somewhere, watching, listening. What a privilege it is to open the Word of God with you today. John chapter 18, verse 1. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, talking about the prayer that he had just completed in the previous chapter, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am he. Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Therefore he again asked them, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these, his disciples, go their way to fulfill the word which he spoke. Of those whom you have given me, I lost not one. There he is. That's where Judas went back in chapter 13, last time we saw him. They were at the Last Supper, the Passover meal together. Jesus dipped the bread, hands it to Judas. And he says, what you do, do quickly. He says, Judas went out, and it was night. He said, Satan had entered him, put into his heart to betray Jesus. Haven't seen him since, but he's been doing a lot of work. And on this night, in a place that Judas knew because he'd been there before, appearing to be a disciple of Jesus, Judas was with a new crowd. The Roman cohort, officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, with lanterns and torches and weapons. The Bible says in Luke's gospel, names Judas says, Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. I wonder if you've ever had a traitor in your life. If you've ever been betrayed. Somebody close. Somebody you took time and you invested in. You cared for them. You loved them, you might say. You walked next to them, and you carried their burden, and they carried yours. You brought them in close. You were vulnerable, only to find out later on that for some time before you knew it was true, they were working to betray you, and that person became a traitor. Who is a traitor? What do they do? And most importantly, what are you going to do about it? The Word of God has much to say. A traitor is close. It's someone who's close. You can learn a lot by what Jesus is going through right here. See, an enemy can be anybody. An enemy can be someone that was never close, but they meant you harms. You know, so... I mean, yes, that happens. You don't want that to happen. But they're not a traitor. They're not a betrayer. They're just an enemy. A traitor is someone who you thought was a friend, who you thought was a teammate, who was a coworker, that was your advocate, your mentor, someone in the church, someone next door, someone in your family. 
A traitor is close. The Bible says in John 18, 2, where we just read, it says Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place. He knew where he would be. How did he know that? For Jesus had often met there with his disciples, one of whom for some time was Judas. He was close. Look back, uh, Mark of the same story, Mark chapter 14. Same story, different gospel. Sometimes you pick up different details depending on the writer's perspective. How close was Judas? Several years ago, I was in the Middle East for a gospel endeavor. I couldn't preach like this to crowds of people. It was illegal. I couldn't meet in the city square. I couldn't rent a park. That, that's not a thing. It was an Islamic kingdom. There was a king. Islam was the national religion, and that was just what it was. But I could have conversations one-on-one. -on -one. I could build relationships. I could earn trust, and I could sit down at dinner tables and coffee shops, and I could talk to people, and that was okay. And I could share carefully the gospel. A man over there introduced me to a Palestinian guy one day. Had a wife and two little kids. This is my friend, such and such. We met, shook hands. Um, he said, would you like to come, the man, Palestinian, he said, would you like to come to my house for dinner? He said, we can talk. And I said, that, they like to talk a lot. I like to talk a lot. <laughs> this is what I do. So I was like, sure, I would like to come for dinner. And uh, he said, we'll make a, we'll make a uh, you like lamb and, you know, all the typical things. And I said, lamb and garlic and coffee and everything that smells bad when you breathe in one spot. <laughs> and I said, that sounds fantastic. I like all of those things in excess. And he said, well, I'll have you over. So we go to his house. And we sit down for dinner and we get into a long, you know, we're, we're, we're taking it easy at first. And then we get into a long, pretty intense friendly conversation about spiritual things, about God, about what he believes and I believe and the differences and some of the implications in politics and his kingdom and American democracy. It was crazy. So we talked about all this stuff and we, he wasn't that we ate a bunch of food. I was like sick. And he said, uh, he said, do you want to move into the living room and have some coffee? And I said, sure. And he gave me this little cup of coffee. And I said, dude, I'm going to need some more coffee than that. I'll tell you what, I drink a lot of coffee. He said, ah, why don't you try it first? And I tried it, and I did not need any more. It was a different kind of coffee, okay? <laughs> and so he's got these little kids, and I'm trying to earn it with this guy. So, you know, he had little kids, and I had little kids. And so his daughter's, like, sitting by me, looking at me. This little Arab girl doesn't speak a word of English. And she keeps saying things to me in Arabic, wanting me to answer her, and looking like, why are you not responding? I don't speak Arabic, sister. So I just took her and threw her on the couch. I took her and I threw her down. And the guy looked at me and his eyes got big and I thought, this might be the end right now. This might be it. <laughs> this is either going to go really good between me and this man or this is it. And uh, he looked and he starts laughing real loud. I'm like, good to go. So I get down on the rug on the living room floor and I start beating this girl with a pillow. And she's coming at me, cracking up, screaming stuff in air. Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, come closer. Pow! You know, knock this girl down. And, and this guy was pumped, you know. And so... We became friends in that gesture. He trusted me, you understand? Like, you, you got to, like, for him to allow that. And, and, he, and he trusted me. And when we left, I went to the door, and he said, oh, thank you for coming, my friend. And in um, Arabic custom, Middle Eastern custom, he hugged me, and he kissed me on this cheek. And I was forewarned this might happen. This isn't really my game, but I took it as a, I'm like, that meant something. He was saying something. We're friends now. I trust you. I, I, you. You know, you're welcome here. You can eat my food, drink my coffee, play with my children. You can interact with my family. And he kissed me on this cheek, and I turned, and he kissed me on this cheek, and he embraced me. We were friends. Love that guy. Mark 14, 43. Immediately while he was still speaking, same story. Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who were from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now he who was betraying him had given them a signal saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him, lead him away under guard. After coming, Judas immediately went to him, Jesus, saying, Rabbi, teacher, and kissed him. 
and they laid hands on him and seized him. Oh, man. They were friends. I wonder if it was ever your friend. Rabbi, so good to see you. Hello, Judas. Who do you seek here today? He kisses Jesus, and they knew that's the guy. He leveraged his friendship to betray him. Maybe that happened to you. It can happen as close as your own family. It's as old as the first family. There was a traitor in the book of Genesis. His name was Cain. And his brother was Abel. People betray us for different reasons, don't they? Cain was mad at God and jealous of his brother. Because he was a fraud and he was a fake and God knew it and nobody else did. So the Lord accepted his brother Abel's offering of worship and rejected Cain's. And so rather than deal with God and get his heart right with the Lord, he found a punching bag in his brother. He found jealousy in his heart filled with rage and anger and murderous thoughts. And the Lord came to his brother Cain and he said, Cain, why is your countenance fallen? Sin, maybe somebody here today, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you. It wants to destroy you, but you must master it. Surrender it, give it up. And he said, will not your countenance be lifted up? He wouldn't listen. And he hardened his heart and he hated his brother. And it was going to be easy because his brother trusted him. The Bible says later on they were out in the field together. Certainly Abel wasn't looking. Why would he need to look? It's his brother. You don't have to look behind you. You don't have to watch your back when it's family. And Cain rose up against Abel in the field and struck his brother down in cold blood and killed him in the field. A traitor is close. Aaron was the brother of Moses. Moses went up on the mountain to meet with God, told him what they were doing, left his brother in charge. Take care of these people. I'll be back when the Lord says... In the people's mind, Moses was taking too long, and this business with God is not what they anticipated. So they came to Aaron, and they said, let's make a new God. We don't like what's going on here. Let's make a God of our own. What Aaron should have done is defend his brother and the righteousness of God. Instead, what he did, he said, give me your gold. Give me your rings, your earrings, everything gold. They melted it down, formed it into a calf. Moses comes down from the mountain. Who is responsible for this? My brother? Wow. You could go a long way with traitors in the Bible. You could talk about Joseph's brothers if you like. We could talk about Samson and Delilah. The Bible says that Samson loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Loved her. Samson was under the Nazarite vow too much to go into. And through the vow and through God's sovereign choice, Samson was a powerful deliverer, anointed by the spirit of the living God to accomplish great feats beyond physical imagination. It was not his strength that did it. It was the power of God working through him as a deliverer. Pulled up the city gates, tore a lion in half with his bare hands. Killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Not because he was super fit or a valiant warrior, but because God was with him. Delilah comes to Samson because the Philistines, the enemies of Samson, had paid her, very similar, huh? Had paid her money to find out where is the source of his strength. And they knew that he would not trust them because they were merely an enemy. But a traitor, if they could find a traitor, and they did, and he loved her. Where does it come from, Samson? Where does it come from? Not supposed to say it's the Lord. Why does it matter? Where does it come from? And what does she say? How can you say I love you? You say you love me when your heart is not with me. Just tell me. It's okay. Okay. I'm under a Nazarite vow, part of the vow, so I never cut my hair. If my hair is ever shaved, I will become weak like any other man. 
Thank you. Not so hard. I love you. I love you too. Why don't you take a rest? And the Bible says he went to sleep on her lap. She'd already made her deal. She shook him awake. They were waiting in the other room. The Philistines are upon you, Samson, she said. He rose up, and what did he say? I will shake myself free as other times before. But he didn't know that he was laying in a traitor's lap. And his hair was shaved, and he went to engage the Philistines and had become weak like any other man. And they apprehended him, gouged out his eyes, and chained him in a dungeon. Why, traitor? So close. So dangerous. A traitor is close. A traitor means you harm. The Bible says in John 18, 3, that Judas, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Not a peaceful meeting. Judas, good evening. Lanterns and torches and weapons. Rabbi, kiss. A traitor means you harm. And they can be clever. They can be crafty. While at the same time, they can pretend to love you like Delilah. They can pretend to be your friend. And you can pretend to have loyalty like Judas or a family member that would never betray you like Cain or Aaron. Many times they spend time working in the shadows against you. Garnering an alliance of betrayal taking people's hearts that are also your friends one by one, listening with a listening ear and what appears to be a sympathetic heart, endearing people for the purpose of destroying you and your reputation. They only comment when necessary to sow seeds of destruction, to tear down your name, to reshape a narrative, to take from you and to bring you to ruin. Judas had formed an alliance since he left the dinner that night. What you do, do quickly, Judas. Good evening. And he went out, and it was night. We haven't seen him for five chapters. Here he is. Been busy. Traitors are busy in the shadows. One of the most famous traitors in the Bible. Maybe you've heard of him, maybe you haven't. His name is Absalom. If you don't know him, you might know his father. His name is David. Killed Goliath, became the king. Might sound familiar. David, not a perfect man, not a perfect father by any stretch of the imagination, but the Bible does say he was a man after God's own heart. He would sin, but he would be broken in repentance, sackcloth and ashes before the Lord, seeking God's grace and mercy, and God would give it. David wasn't a perfect king, but he was a really good one. He was a valiant warrior. He loved his troops, his mighty men, and they they gave loyalty to him. He had honor. He had integrity and honesty. Again, not a perfect man, and he was at times a traitor himself, but would repent to the Lord. Make it right when he could. The Bible says he was such a good king that there was a season of time that the Bible uses this phrase that says everything David did seemed good in the sight of the people. Everybody loved David. They're like, whoa, look at this guy. This guy's awesome. David was a handsome man, specimen of a man, if you want. It says he was handsome and ruddy in appearance. Probably had great hair. You know, got that Middle Eastern skin. You know, this is square, jawboned. I don't know. I didn't know him. <laughs> Handsome man. But what, I'll tell you what. Whatever David was, whatever his appearance was that was striking, Absalom, his son, was so much more. So much more. Better hair. One of the only, it is one of the only people in the Bible that we make a big deal about his hair except for Samson. The Bible makes a thing about Absalom's hair. He had this enormous, wavy hair. He would cut it once a year, and the Bible says when they would cut his hair, it would weigh us. They would weigh it. (laughs) Guy was an egomaniac, man. Weigh my hair. Weigh my hair. Nobody's hair is heavier than my hair. Like that's that's what the Bible says. They would weigh his hair, and he would grow it again. They would look at his hair, you know. And he was a handsome boy. Wow. Come through town, and there would be a procession before the prince. 
It says he had chariots that would escort him. 50 men would run as runners before. Absalom is coming. Absalom. Stop the intersections. People would look. They would be in shock at the appearance of this guy. He was amazing. But he wasn't king. And he started to grow to hate his father. Oh, but David, Absalom, all your father, they would say. I wonder if anyone in here has a little jealousy seed. I can press this button right now. You start to hear about your friend. You start to hear about your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, your family, somebody. And people talk about how great they are, how admirable they are, how much they've accomplished, how good of an athlete they are, how good of a worker they are. And what happens? Oh, that's what happened to Absalom. He would look in the mirror and he would say, how is this possible? They keep talking about my father. I wish I were the king. So he makes a decision. He sees the loyalty of the people. And he says, I'm going to go get them. One by one, I'm going to go get them. I'm going to endear myself to them and I'm going to get them. One by one, I'm going to take my father down. Let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 15, back in the Old Testament, way back to the left toward the beginning. Maybe you've had an Absalom in your life. If we want to be honest and humble this morning, maybe you are an Absalom. Let's see if God might do work both ways, okay? 2 Samuel chapter 15. Verse 1. I've given you enough about Absalom. Let's take a look at the story. Verse 1. Let's start in verse 1. I told you about this part. It came about after this that Absalom provided for himself a chariot and horses and 50 men as runners before him. What did he do? They mean you harm, traitors. Verse 2. Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. And when any man had a suit or a problem with the law or some dispute with his neighbor or whatever, to come to the king for judgment, the king who was David, Absalom would call to him and say, from what city are you? And he would say, your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, see, your claims are good and right, but no man listens to you on the part of the king. Hmm. Verse 4, moreover, Absalom would say, oh, that one would appoint me judge in the land. Then every man who has any suit or cause could come to me, and I would give him justice. Verse 5, and when a man came near to prostrate himself before him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. Well, that sounds familiar. Verse 6, in this manner, Absalom dealt with all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole away the hearts of the men of Israel. Before you know it, David will be running for his life. And who is behind it all? His own son. You ever have an Absalom in your life? Oh, coach, they would say, coach, if you'd put me in their position, I wouldn't have made those mistakes. I've been working hard, and they just don't want to put the work in anymore. If you'd start me in the game, go to your boss, your employer, man, boss, sorry that happened. You know, my hope is to earn my way to that position. If I were in that position, that never would have happened, not on my watch. I saw that coming, and I thought about saying something, but it wasn't my place, man. I'm sorry. I probably should have said something. I could have stopped it, and that mistake at work wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. Is that right? If I were your husband, I'd treat you better than that. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I sure would. Oh, you're such a good listener. I wish he listened to me like you do. Well, you're important to me. And maybe he doesn't find you as important as I do, but I'm happy to listen. Oh, great. If I were your wife, 
I would appreciate you more than she does. I would respect you. I'd take good care of you. Really? I wish that was the case, but it isn't. I know. But I'll tell you what. If you ever need anything, give me a call. Okay, Absalom. Okay. What do you do? Not going to live very long and avoid this. There's going to be a Judas. There's going to be an Absalom. There's going to be a Delilah. There's going to be a Cain. There's going to be an Aaron. It's in humanity. It's in all of us. And you're going to turn around to someone you loved, feel a pain in your back, and realize they put the knife there for a variety of reasons. So what do we do? Well, I'll give you three really difficult, hard things, and then it'll all be fixed, and you can go and you won't have any problems the rest of the day. I'm going to start with this. Everything we're about to say next cannot happen if you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord. Because you cannot do it by your willpower. You cannot do it even if you want to do it. You cannot do it by intellect. You cannot do it by inner strength. You cannot do it by personal resolve. You have to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit, of the living God, working in you and making you a new creation and transforming your mind. So maybe the first step for somebody here today is to call out to Jesus as Lord to be saved, not only from your own sin, but from the pain of others' sins that have been committed against you. Because everything the Word of God says next has to come by miracle. But it can, and it does happen, and it sets the captive free. One. you got to do three things, okay? Here we go. Ready? One. And each one is going to be harder than the next one, okay? So when this comes out, you're like, oh, it gets worse. (laughs) Admit that there's a little Judas in all of us. Everybody loves to be the self-righteous one. It's easy to be the victim. No one likes to be the villain. You got to see the Judas in the mirror first. In that story we just read, In the garden, when they come to arrest with lanterns and torches and weapons, the very next thing that happens, we'll look at it soon, there's a guy standing behind Jesus reaching for a sword. His name is Peter. And he's, you got to be kidding me, Judas. You got to be kidding me. And a guy named Malchus goes to arrest Jesus, and Peter pulls his sword and tries to take what I believe is his head off. And he misses, and he takes his ear off. And Jesus says, Put put the sword away. What are you doing? That self-righteous indignation. You have to be kidding me. The thing is, though, just a little while later, someone's going to ask that same Peter, hey, don't you know that guy getting whipped in there? And you know what he's going to say? I've never seen that guy before in my life. Oh, but Judas, what? There's a little bit of Judas in all of us. We've all listened to gossip that we shouldn't have because we enjoyed it. We enjoyed somebody that we were jealous of being torn down. We enjoyed finally hearing something that was bad that only people talk good about. We've contributed to the gossip. We've contributed. We've lied about people. We've slandered reputation. We've cut throats to get ahead at work or on sports teams. Sure we have. There's a Judas in every mirror you've ever looked in. And if we can be humble enough to go... God, forgive me first. It's going to help you. And then you have to give up the fight. You admit, man, I've done it too. And I might not have done this one. And I might not have done it that way, but I've done it. And then you go, now this has happened to me. There's an Absalom in my life. And I'm not going to make it my fight. I give up. You surrender the fight. You walk away. Romans chapter 12. Verse 
Verse 17. I like those rowdy Sundays in here, but sometimes you got to preach a quiet one. Yeah. <laughs> right? Sometimes. Oh, man. I like the amen and hallelujah Sundays, but it can't all be fireworks. Sometimes it's got to be terrible and awful and quiet. You got to give up the fight. You got to give your Judas over. You got to give your get Absalom up. Romans 12, 17, look what the Bible says. Maybe the most important word that somebody can highlight today for your context is never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Boy, we want to. I'm not going to fault you for wanting to, but you can't. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Somebody's going to say, well, they didn't respect what was right. I know, but that's why this is talking to you. If possible, so far it depends on you, be at peace with all men. They will never have peace with me. I know, so far it depends on you. Verse 19, there it is again. It must be important. He said it twice. Never take your own revenge. Oh, I want to. I know that. Never do it, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Vengeance is his. doesn't belong to you. Stop trying to take it out of his hand. It's not going to be good. Verse 20. If your enemy is hungry, feed him, her. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil. So you trying to exact your own revenge, Peter trying to pull that sword out like many of us do, you're going to be overcome by evil. You will end up being hurt the most. But overcome evil with good. After all, isn't that what Jesus did? Right? Here's Judas. He says, Jesus, in that text we read, knowing all things, he knew. He didn't have any questions. But yet, what did he say? Evening, everybody. Wow, a lot of people here tonight in this garden. Whom do you seek? He knows the answer to that. He could have called fire down from heaven. You're talking about the guy that when there was a storm on the sea and they thought they were going to die, went, shh, peace be still. And the weather obeyed him. The wind and the waves obeyed him. He could have handled this. What does the Bible say he did? 1 Peter 2.23 says, actually, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. He would be taken to trial. His reputation will be trashed. People will tell lies and say he did and said things he never did and said. That happens to us. And we want to correct, constantly correct the narrative. What are they saying about me? You, well, let me tell you what. There are two sides to every story. Let me tell you my side. You want to hear my side? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Just don't tell it. And that's not what culture says. It's not what society says. It might not be what your family, your parents, your school. It might not be what anybody said. It's what Jesus did. He did not revile in return. What does the Bible say? He answered them not a word. And you're, you read the story at the crucifixion, and you want to yell into the Bible, speak up for yourself, Jesus. That's a lie. And he won't do it. Why? It says, well, suffering he uttered no threats. I ever hear you say that about me again? I'm going to tell people what I know about you. Nope. No, we're not going to do that. You know what I got on you? I've known you for 30 years. You know what I could tell people? You know what I've never told you? You told people that about me? You just wait. I'm going to tell everybody. No, no, we're not because we're Christians. It says that he, Jesus, kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. God, you see it. You hear it. You know it. I leave room for the wrath of God. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Don't try to take it. And if that's what Jesus did, why do we think we have a past to do something different? Leave it alone. Let God be God. Let him have it. Let his wrath be what it will be, when it will be, how it will be, and you leave it alone. Matthew chapter 5. We're still not done. Then you love and pray for your enemy. Oh, 
Now, when I say love, you say, that's impossible. I'm not talking about the lies that the world tells about love. No, no butterfly. That's not what love is. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. Love is a Holy Spirit-inspired action. So if your enemy is hungry, you feed him. You love him. They are thirsty. You give them a drink. You serve. You love them. You love and pray for them. Oh, my goodness. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 38. Look at the words of our Lord Jesus. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Man, I like that one. Some of us wish it stopped right there, and that is what it was said. That's, what, that's the verse you want to put on your living room wall and put some names under it. Like, that's right. Eye for an eye, slander for slander, pain for pain, hurt for hurt. Nope. Verse 39, Jesus said, you've heard that, and we've heard it, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Dropping bombs here, Jesus. Verse 41, whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you. Do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And we're like, yeah, but I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. I'm going to tell you what, you try it. Just try it. By an act of the Holy Spirit-inspired will in you, try it. And see if you can hate them as much while you're praying for them. It's impossible. So that you may be sons of your father, children of your father who is in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Or how is that difficult? Do not even the tax collectors, the sinners, the wicked do the same. If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Therefore, you are to be perfect, perfect in your forgiveness. Perfect in your peace as your Father in heaven is perfect. You say, that's impossible. I would agree, but the Bible says with man it is impossible. With God, all things are possible. That's why you have to know the Lord, to have the power of the Lord to do it. Amen. wonder if you've ever had a traitor. I wonder if you got one now. I wonder if you are one. Let's bow for prayer this morning, okay? I'd like to just allow us to just sit in this moment for a bit. Our team's going to play for a little bit. Somebody here battling through something. Maybe your traitor passed away a long time ago, but they, they still own a piece of your soul. That rage that boils over in you, that vengeance you wish you could have taken and never did, or you tried and it wasn't satisfying, was it? And now they're gone. And what do you do about it? Try this. Admit that you're a traitor too. And if to nobody you can think of, we've definitely done it to God. So many times. And what if you just gave all that rage and all that vengeance, that battle in your heart, what if you just gave it over to the Lord right now? Say, God, I can't do it. I can't satisfy it. I can't find peace in it. I just give it to you, Lord. I trust you with it, and I'm walking away. I'm leaving it here. Maybe go a step further. You pray for that person. You got your traitor's name. Long time ago, before I got to the end of this message, you know their name right now. What if in the humility of your own heart, you lifted them up to the Lord? You just prayed for them as the Spirit led your heart to do so. It's going to be real hard to hate them. I'm not saying you're not hurt. I'm not saying you're not angry. It's going to be hard to wish for their destruction and go before the Lord at the same time. Try it. Try it right now. Take some time with the Lord this morning.